thinking about it. Yeah. All right. And we are live. All right. Mid, uh, mid cup, uh, ready for your sip of water there. Can you carry us for like five seconds? Of course I, I can. Drink? Take your All vodka. Right. It's good. <laughs> it's 11 30 on the game weekend. We're good. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it's Friday. Uh, Friday. We are excited uh, to be on live for probably about an hour. Or so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what they're any. Uh, how 60 to minutes. 60, hey, yeah, yeah, not, should... not quite as hard hitting as that. <laughs> but uh, we're going to talk uh, hopefully with Marlon Kerner here in a little bit. Yep. Our guy, our recurring guest about, uh, you know, matching up against the Dolphins this weekend. Uh, I want to get his opinion like we got Kurt Schultz's opinion about facing uh, the double monster of the model. Uh, who has yeah, kept ahead. my life up for a couple nights now talking about their speed. Uh, so I'm curious to get his opinion on that. And then maybe, uh, you know, in college, you went to Ohio State, and I'm sure there were games where he was – they were clearly the better team. Whether they want to admit it or not, you know, favorite – oh, here he is right now. All popping right. in in a sec. Uh, they're the better team. And just the, the mindset of going into a game that – obviously, everybody's going to tell you, you know, you got to win, you know. But let's let's get into that. With yeah, Marlon, here he is. Because I was with Marlon the day after – the beatdown of Georgia TCU, and of course he had his ideas about what oh. Ohio State would have done. Okay, so Marlon, we, right we, we got a couple of <laughs> couple of housekeeping uh, items with you. First, of all, welcome. First of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us, Marlon. Um, that that Twitter post that uh, that I made last week, I heard that you were claiming that you were trying to bat the ball down rather than catch the ball on the punt the punt against Dallas. Yeah, it's a punt. I was just batting it. It was going backwards. So as a gunner, okay, you, well, miss, you, you go with the first touch. So you always try to smack it and knock it far away. So the ref says the ball was touched here instead of letting it bounce back six or seven I, yards. You lose field. My position. my apologies. My apologies then for the 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 DB crack on that one. I I uh, I, I stand corrected. Uh, on on your Buckeyes and the uh, and the college championship. What uh, what were your thoughts on Monday night? I mean, I, I figured whoever won that Ohio State Georgia game was gonna blow TCU out. Um, I didn't think I didn't think TCU and the conference that they play in um could slow either one of those offenses down. Um I was really surprised that Michigan tried to play cute and do some things like you, you run the Philly special when you could you only needed to pick up a yard and you could have just powered and just went and got that first down. So I think Michigan really kind of tried to get too cute and out coach themselves out of a win. Um, and TCU was finding all cylinders. I mean, they really surprised Michigan, but I knew they didn't have enough to hold up against Georgia. And I thought, hey, listen, if, if we beat Georgia, we're going to beat TCU because they don't play defenses and we can play a track meet game and just trade trade touchdowns um, with them. So I wasn't surprised at the 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 final out out the final score of the game um, and the outcome of the game just because yeah, I was like TCU. And, and it's also the thing like Georgia's been there, right? Um, that's a really big game for TCU. And no matter what players try to tell you, like, I I'm ready, I'm going to treat this like any other game, you understand the magnitude and and what that game means as you're able to win it. Uh, and it looked like the nerves kind of got them early uh, because they made some mistakes early in the game. And then outside of that, once Georgia got rolling, um, that was it, that you weren't going to slow down that juggernaut. Speaking of like, you know, overmatched big moments, whatever. So you're the Bills, you know, Sunday. You're now with a 13 point favorite. You know, the Dolphins are your rival, but beat up. It's kind of a shell of a team coming here. Uh, how how difficult do you think it is? How easy do you think it is for the Bills mentally? You know, knowing two is not playing, Teddy Bridgewater is probably not playing. Like walking in a game like that, even though it's a playoff game, as a big favorite. Like, what's the mindset? Like, what are you telling each other? Like, what, how would you feel? You know, walking into the, into this game, gotta take care of business is what they're thinking. But easier, than yeah. Not. Take care of business. Um, we don't look at the spread. We don't look at all those things. Um, you know that those guys get paid, um, just like you do, uh, and they have a lot of pride, uh, and they always play us tough. Um, so you know that they're gonna be fired up. They they're selling the same thing that we're saying. Like, listen, we've got a reason. We want to win this um, for the adversity that our city has gone through um, all year long uh, for what the Mar went through. So you've got your reasons of why you want to try to get to it and win it all. And they've got the same thing. Like nobody's giving us a chance. Um, you know, we're 13 point underdogs into this game. So really they're just kind of going into it. Like, you know, we could really up end and spoil the season and you have to have the mindset of like, that's not going to happen. Uh, and so we're going to come in and you, you got to be ready to go. You got to run the ball. 
because that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to run the ball and, and control the clock because you want to take as many opportunity and possessions away from Josh and the offense. So it's not going to be like they're going to spread it out and go five wide and be like, here we go. Let's go Warren Moon and run and shoot it. It's going we're going to hand the ball off, see if we can pop one, play sound defense and make them be methodical um, and see if they can sustain drives uh, and is, and see if you get a chance. Is it easier on their side, you know, on the Miami side, there's pressure in this game, right? I mean, you're not expected to win. You just come in loose and and, and say, hey, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. Let's just play hard. Like, is it ever easier? Were you ever in a game where you kind of felt maybe a little overmatched or, you know, shorthanded? I mean, yeah, you've had games where you're like, yo, this team is loaded. They have the offensive weapons. Their offensive line is better. They, they, they're they running backs. Like, you can go down the list and do a check, like, who has the edge here? Um, and I let – you know, the guys in the pregame and, and the announcers like go and, and discuss who's better here, who's better there. I think as a player, I always came into like if I knew we were underdogs or knew we were overmatched or they were clearly like like favored, uh, then you kind of say, listen, the pressure's all on them. Like they have to play well. Um, and on any given Sunday, it doesn't matter. So my job is to study, understand what we can do. We always tried to say if we keep it close, then they get a little tight. Like most teams will kind of like, uh oh, like you know you should be winning the game. So if I can keep this close and give myself a chance to maybe win it in the end, then you can pull it out. Um, and so we always try to do that and see if the team that had, you know, hey, listen, like everyone's looking at the Bills like you should win this game. So now you're saying, hey, if, if the pressure gets tight, do they make the mistake? Like try to put it back in their, in their court and see if they can play mistake-free football. Um, and a lot of teams, for some reason, can't. Like, that's why you see the upsets. You just kind of let me keep it close. Let me do this. Let me be smart. So if I'm Miami, no big plays. You know Stefan Diggs is going to get some catches. Great. He can have 10 catches. He can have 10 catches for 80 yards. But when he catches the ball, I tackle him right there. Um, don't let Devin Singletary pop long runs. Like, don't let Gabe Davis run through and pick up 50-yard um, bombs out of the way because that blows the game open and you have to get then out of your game plan. Your game plan as Miami coming in is we're probably going to have an inexperienced quarterback. Um, he might, He's going to have to make some plays with his arms and his legs, but we're going to try to help him out by running the ball and playing sound defense and not giving up too many big plays. And if we can do that and we keep it to a low-scoring game, one of those 21-17 style games, You've got a chance. You got a chance to win it because mm -hmm. now the pressure comes back on the home team. Like you're at home. Buffalo's got to they've got to play smart. You're going to have the crowd rocking. You've got a lot of reasons that you, you want to win this game. But you also got to play mistake free football. Um, and if you can put it where Josh has to decide if I'm going to try to play hero ball and see if he's going to try to make all the plays on his own or if he's going to trust his teammates and say, we're going to win this out. And I'll trust Tyler Bass to make the winning field goal kick. Um, then, yeah, then, yeah, you, you could say there could be a mistake and then that would be something that Miami could capitalize on. That is kind of how the last game played out. I mean, Miami got an eight point lead in the fourth quarter, I think, yeah. and it did force Josh Allen and company to make plays and they did make the plays and uh, but, you know, had a little magic snow happen there, too. Um, Marlon, as I told you earlier in the week, we had former uh, safety Kurt Schultz on, who was a teammate of yours. And uh, we talked to him a little bit about just a nightmare of covering those super speedy um, receivers that Miami has. And, uh, you know, he admitted that, you know, the, the corners have ha, are the first line there that have the hard job of trying to keep them, you know, letting them get free. And if it does happen, it's a nightmare. But um, as a corner, what – what are your responsibilities or what can you do best to try to neutralize guys? You just talked about, Hey, the Miami would be okay. If Diggs got 10 catches for 80 yards, but tackle them right there. What do you, what do you do against uh, receivers like that as a corner? I think it all depends on your game plan, right? Like um, if you're, if you're able to play some cover two behind it, where you got safeties, you can be a little bit more aggressive at the line of scrimmage. Um, so you can really try to, disrupt the timing of the offense you i think the teams that played the miami um and really affected how their pass game was or threw off the timing uh i look at the san francisco game uh they really got physical at the line of scrimmage with those guys like their corners their linebackers they even had defensive ends walking out but everyone jammed everyone wanted to throw off the timing of that quick passing game because you know two wants to get back or whoever quarterback it is going to want you want to get back 
one, two, three, where's my read, balls out, in rhythm, catch, and then they try to let those guys work in space and see if they can make someone miss. And they are shifty enough to do that. So if you can disrupt the timing and make him hold it, now my defensive line has the ability to kind of really can get up the field, get the pass rush going. And so my San Francisco was the team that I really saw that was really able to disrupt the timing game. And they still completed some passes. They still did some good things. Um, and, and I think Tyreek had uh, – or one of them had a good game um, in there because when the ball came out, you know, they're able to run through the zones and do some things. So, so they have a talented group. You know, if you're going to play a little bit more man to man or play off, then you got to understand if I'm playing off, I can't play too far off. Like I can't give a, a six, seven yard cushion and say, here, catch this. Because if I'm coming up trying to trying to get five, six yards in space, like that's a lot to try to say, hey, I, I, I might make that tackle. I might not miss that tackle. So you're going to try to do what I like to say is um, keep that upfield shoulder. Like, I just don't want anybody running by me. Um, hey, if you if you want to catch an out, great. You can catch an out. Like, I'll give that up. If you want to catch a, a little slant here and there, I'm going to be there on you. Um, and we're going to really punish you and try to hit you and jar that ball loose. Um, but really, we don't want to give up any deep balls because that's what blows the game open um, against us. And then you then you get out of what you want to do. Like, if, if you're down 14 or you're down eight, like we were in that game, then now you're lying on the offense to come back and say, come in and do some things. And, and I don't think they're, they want to keep the lid on our offense as well. So we can't really give up too many big plays, but those are some of the things that I would do as a corner. Can you kind of describe for people like Don, I, what's it like with somebody who has like world-class speed? You know, I mean, you obviously <laughs> NFL players have unbelievable athleticism. You're in the top, you know, point percent of a seed and athleticism but the guy like Kershaw described randy moss running by him uh, he got he got he loose and, and it was him and kurt one-on-one -on -one, and yeah. he said he just blew right past me and it wasn't even fair like i guess you know what what is it like was not even just speed but maybe you know strength or or athleticism or like what's it like if you're up against a guy who's just world class at one aspect of the game and and let me add too we had don Bibian, uh who you know set the record uh, the, the, with Dion at Combine for the, the 40 dash. He know it till years later, so, but he did. I might suggest that you would look at a player like BB with just that world-class straight-ahead speed. And then, I don't know if Ottle has quite that. Maybe he does, even if he's close. But to me, what makes Ottle <clears throat> or Hill, both of them maybe, especially Hill, because we've had to watch him in Kansas City for these years, but is this just change of direction to combine with that. Uh, man, just a scary package. Yeah, I mean, I had to go against uh, Marvin Harrison all those years, um, being there, watching him when he came in, and he was really fast and shifty. Um, we we had a guy, uh, Bert Emanuel, who played for the Falcons. He was a, a quarterback out of Rice University when I came into the league, super fast. We played him in college, and he ran like a – he was clocked at – supposedly like a 4-2, 4 40. Um, and so the main thing was always you wanted to kind of not let them run by you. Um, and that's easier said than done. Uh, so mm -hmm. the thing I loved about the playoffs uh, and, and what most corners love about the playoffs is you get to grab and clutch a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, receive the, 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 the refs mm -hmm. don't call as much as they would call in the regular season. So you always try to just try to be physical enough at the line to get your hands on them so that it's just not a track meet because you just don't want a foot race with them. Like if, if I don't put a finger on you and you just go and take off on the go route, then I'm trying to really be like, uh oh, like can my four three catch up to your four two? Okay, no, probably not. Um, so you always try to make sure you get a little physical at the line, um, and, and you do that by grabbing a little bit. Like not gonna lie, like yeah, if it's not caught, <laughs> not holding. Uh, so that's right. You, you like trying to get the jam and we would try to get underneath the shoulder pads where you could grab like here. You try to get underneath the armpit so you can pull them into your body. And then when you got on the shoulder, you know, we did little things like you push into the hip. Um, you might throw your hand back um, and hit the thigh, um, you know, just kind of like make a fist and punch back because um, they can't you can't run if you can't bring your legs up. Um, so and then you just run with them. Uh, and so you do all those little things. But I was also very cognizant of fast guys like all right, I need to change my angle. Like if he does beat me off the line of scrimmage, I have to take a deeper angle. I need to go further up the field to meet him down the line um, as opposed to turning and automatically getting into a trail technique. Uh, and so once you understand like, okay, well, look, if he's running the go route, I can't meet him at the 35. I need to meet him at the 40. 
then you just bend up your angle and run to a point where we are going to intersect down the sideline because the ball, I had some really good coaches. Um, Dick Roach was always like, hey, if it's a go route, it's going to land about 42, 44 yards. So knowing that the ball is going to be 40 yards down the field, I don't need to take myself out of the play and trail and try to catch up to his hands. I'm going to just take a, de- take a deeper angle and run to where I think the ball is going to land um, and then try to play it from there. All right, let me. Can you, you, you're the perfect person to clear something up for me. I'm, I'm at a bar. I'm watching the game with friends. I'm <laughs> yeah, in the stadium. Just and I'm at this, or I'm at the stadium. Okay, and this is what I hear all the time. And I, and I, I've never been able to kind of explain to people why didn't he just turn around? Why didn't he just turn around? Why didn't he see the ball? Like, can you please explain to people how difficult it is to be running full speed and have the ball either slightly underthrown or thrown perfectly, and you're, you know, giving everything you have to try to, you know, <laughs> cover the recall, and all of a sudden Come somebody, on, around, somebody in row four is pissed off because you didn't turn we're, around. We're on TV. Yeah, yeah, it just, I hear that constantly, and it drives me nuts. Being, being, you know, blessed enough to be on the sideline and watching you guys at full speed, like it, it, it's, it's impossible to describe to people. Maybe, maybe you could uh, try to help people understand why you just don't turn around and knock the ball every time. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I can, I can help answer that. Maybe shed some light to that that question because sure. I hear that all the time too. Um, it, it depends on the coaching, uh, and so every coach has their own style. Um, we were taught from a young age. Like if you're in a trail technique, you never look back um, because if the ball goes over your head, all you're going to do is when you turn and look back and see the ball go over your head, you're going to watch him catch it. So you don't turn around until I can get to your hands. If I can touch your hands, then I can look back for the ball because then I have a better shot of knocking that ball down. Um, and, 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 and the way we were coached were um, I need to be hip to hip for me to really feel comfortable in turning around and looking for the ball. Um, so if he had one step on me, then my best shot was to play his eyes or play his hands. Um, the, now, what it doesn't do is, is you don't know as a corner if the ball is under thrown. Uh, and so when people yell at you like, don't, don't, why did you look back? It's because the ball was under thrown. And most NFL quarterbacks don't really under throw the ball that often. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're as a corner, you're just trying to run and catch up because when he does this, I can do this and then I can club through and I have a better chance of getting the ball out. Um, and so again, if I'm not hit the hip or if I'm not running stride for stride with you, I don't feel comfortable doing this because all I'm going to do is turn, look and watch your hands do this. And then either I'm diving at your feet and hopefully I hit them or you're just running into the end zone. And either way I go, I'm, I'm on sports center and getting, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I take it's my re- chance of trying to swipe at the ball and knocking it out of his hands. Is it, is it difficult to read, to read guys eyes? And I've, and I've heard some guys are better than others in, in kind of just uh, you know, looking back for the ball. Doesn't Hill wear a, with a, with a, uh, Oh, a visor. Yeah. Does, visor, a visor, does a visor right? hurt? Does that hinder you at all either? Um, uh, the visor sometimes hurts um, guys because you can't see their eyes. Like most guys' eyes get big because they're running with the ball and they're like, oh, the ball's coming. Um, so now you know, oh, the ball's coming. Um, I think I've heard uh, Diggs being one of the hardest guys to do it because he doesn't really tip anything off. He He's really good at catching it at the last second. Uh, and so those are some of the games that you play, the chess match within the game um, that you're playing of how do you defend a receiver. Uh, yeah, visors will kind of d- dictate what you can and cannot do. Um, and so then if, if the guy's wearing a visor and I can't really play his eyes, then I'm really just going to try to play his hands. And I'm just going to kind of wait and watch and do all those things and wait till he does this or wait at the last second. So a lot of receiver coaches do teach guys to flash their hands late because they know that's what we were waiting for. But, you know, it's playoff football. So if I can be a little bit more physical, um, if I can pull you into my hip or do anything I can to slow you down, I'm going to do that. Uh, and then, you know, they're going to make plays. Uh, and so the thing about it is, you know what we what I mentioned earlier is I'm I'm okay if if, if I'm Miami if I'm a, a cornerback playing against Diggs I'm okay if Diggs has ten catches for eighty yards but he doesn't have any touchdowns because that means I didn't give up any big plays and yeah he's going to make his catches he's going to catch some short things he's going to catch a slant um, but as long as I you know we try to go into the game like no no twenty five yard plus pass completions or anything like that then you put yourself on a good chance of having an opportunity to win the game and that's really all you want you just want a chance to win the game. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of zero tolerance from like Joe in the four row when it comes to DBs, right? You know, one catch over your head, or I mean, I was I was the Detroit, I was Detroit for the uh, the Bills Browns game, and 
um, who was it, Peoples Jones or Amari Cooper made an unbelievable catch in the end zone over Dane Jackson. And Dane Jackson was in her position, did nothing wrong. Is a is a superstar paid NFL receiver. Like the man is good. Right. And everybody in the crowd was just outraged that Dane Jackson somehow didn't turn around, knock the ball down, whatever. I'm like, you people have no understanding. Of course, I'm not. I'd like turn around and start yelling at these people, but I'm like, you, th- that is an impossible position to be in 25 is down the field in the corner of the end zone. I feel, I feel legitimately bad for, for DBs. I, I, to me, to me, it's the hardest job in the NFL like, other than quarterback, probably quarterback. And then, and then what you guys have to do. And then if you get beat on a play. You got to line up the next play against the same guy, not get beat again. Like I, I find it, I find it, you know, damn near impossible. What you guys, what you do. Yeah. It's one of the toughest positions. I, I won't argue. I mean, you know, it, it's, you have to understand body position, understand angles. You do a lot of watching of tape of how guys do their footwork and their hands. If there's any tip that they do for any routes, like, you know, it's, it's like being in school all over because we're doing everything. They're running at us full speed and we're running backwards. Uh, and mm-hmm. then we have to turn and keep the momentum that we just gained going backwards to be able to turn and transition and go full speed just by flipping the hips and turning and going and all those things. So, yeah, to, I, and I might be a little biased um, because I had to do that. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I would put corner up there as one of the hard, hardest positions um, to play uh, in the league. And you know, and receivers, I mean, they know where they're going. And you know, it's yeah. it's our job to try to take by body body position half of them away to say I'm not giving this position up, and then make you go the way that I'm not covering to try to jump those out routes or a go route or anything like that. So yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. But if you if you figure out how to do it you can have some success doing it. What percentage of uh, of plays do you think that you knew, you know, where the receiver was going? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I would say a lot of it. Like, um, you, you kind of understand third down. Like, or if they run third down, here's a play that they're going to run. Um, that, but that's coaching. Coaching and understanding, like, these are the plays they run. Like, there's a lot of coaches involved that tell you what's going, what they're going to run. Sometimes you get surprised by guys like, you know, we, we, we played, um, I played, we played against the Browns. They had Andre Risen uh, and Michael Jackson who could really fly, but Andre Risen was really mm-hmm. shifty and so quick. Uh, and even when you had him buttoned up, like I remember we played cover two and you jammed, we got a good jam on him. And then there's a natural little hole that comes after the jam before you get to the safety and Bernie Kosar came out and and jam and I turned and I'm thinking looking for the flat coming to the back um, or to the to the flat or the back coming to the flat if I can speak um and my rising kind of just shifted in between and I'm like oh my gosh and all of a sudden coast are like and he throws a laser right over top of my head and right in between the safety and he hits there like there's always going to be a weakness um in your coverage and so once you understand that you kind of know like all right if they get here they're going to run this if they get in this formation they like to run these three plays and then based off of that movement and what he's doing, um, then you go, oh, he's running this, he's running that. I know what this route's going to be. Uh, and so you, but it's a lot of practice, a lot of repetition. Um, there's never really been anything where you're like, hey, they just ran something totally completely that we really didn't see uh, in this. It happens every now and then. And then once you see it, you go back and you talk about it. Like, hey, they did this this time. And now you're ready for it when it comes again. And you're really able to take it away. But that's a lot of conversations on the sideline. Like, that's why you see guys with the, the papers pulling out. Now you have all the the surface pros out there. You're just talking like they did this, this, this. Oh, okay. Well, that's not something that we've learned about um, in the scouting report, but now we have it added. Um, and then you talk about it at halftime and make an adjustment and then you're fine. Yeah. Um, Marlon fans have gotten pretty excited about uh, the buzz, the news that Micah Hyde is, is kind of on the mend and is made close to uh, being ready to play, I guess not this week, but um, move on with us earlier in the season we were talking about trey white some fans were a little frustrated it was taking so long you having not one but two uh reconstructive acl uh surgeries you you laid it out there made it easy to understand why it's hard to come back from that so with hyde now again a little bit apples and oranges because he had a neck injury but something you said that really stuck with us josh and i referenced this a few times is what you said about um being game ready no matter how hard you practice you can't simulate game speed um here we go again with the corner safety comparisons but would would you say that the safety as as compared to a corner um is is there any advantage that like let's say 
if it, instead of uh, where, where a corner might be missing 18 weeks, maybe for safety only 17 or 16 because of maybe the, the physical demands and the cutting aren't, aren't there or, or not. What, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, yes, I, I, there is definitely a difference between being game ready um, and practice ready. And Micah, as much as he's probably been doing some conditioning and, and getting himself in shape, um, after the surgery and the proce whatever procedure it was that he had um, to fix and remedy his injury. Uh, game is different. Safety and corner are a little bit different. Um, now, Micah is a very smart player, um, very, very good player. Um, and and so when you look at him, safety is a little different because he has Jordan um, Poyer that can do some things that can come down like they're they're interchangeable. So I think for them, they'll understand how to play with each other. Um, you don't forget that. That chemistry will come back pretty quickly between those two guys um, because Micah's also been in all the practices, been in all the meetings. So he's been talking like, Jordan, what do you see on this? How would you have played that? Um, you know, and oh, Micah, what would you have done? Like they talk about that just in case when he comes back. Like so they're on the same page. Uh, so I, I'm excited about it as well, um, just as any other fan, because you'll be able to disguise, I think. One of the things that I saw going into the Bengals game that I saw in an interview, I want to say it was either T. Higgins or, or uh, Tyler Boyd, um, where he's kind of said was, you know, with Micah out, their their secondary, their their coverage got a little bit more basic. Like you couldn't do the drop of safety down here, the run back here, because you didn't have on the back end people that you felt comfortable with that would get themselves back in position um, to make the play that's necessary. Uh, and so what what my, if Micah is able to come back and play next week, um, then it allows you to kind of do a little bit more disguising. You can be a little bit more aggressive in your areas because he's been there. He knows how to do that. Uh, and the one thing about safety is, is even if you feel like, hey, I don't have my foot speed back, if I played at 10 yards, I can play at 12. I can back up a couple yards to give myself a little extra cushion to make the play. Um, whereas this corner, you might not be able to do those things. Like I, I can't back off at 10 yards because I don't feel like I'm not up to um, game speed yet. Like I've got to play a certain style and show a, a certain look um, and without tipping it off. Uh, and so that will benefit the, the secondary um, and the defense going forward if Micah is able to come back because now you have the ability to disguise. You can bring linebackers in different positions. You can do a little bit more things that you were able to do last year when you had the number one defense with him back there. Yeah, I would in the passing, and that makes a lot of sense. I wonder on the flip side, uh, with the safety being a bit more active uh, in the against the run, um, you know, you guys you don't hit each other in practice, uh, right? So when he uh, having a neck injury makes that first hit and he's fine, presumably, I got a feeling like let's go. He's he's going to feel good about that, and his teammates would too. Oh yeah, he's going to be he's going to think about like all right. I'm ready to make this tackle, but I don't think he would come back if he didn't feel like he could come in and make that tackle. Now, one of the things that you can do is the one thing that they were able to do is they could rotate their safety. So depending on where it is, you could like some teams say, hey, strong safety is always down. So sometimes they were like Jordan rotates back, Micah rotates up or vice versa. Jordan rotates down, Micah rotates back. You could just say, hey, I don't want you taking too many hits. You're always going to be back. Um, and so hmm. Jordan would kind of just flip over and run back and forth as opposed to spinning your safeties. So you could do some of those things early um, if you wanted to try to protect him. But knowing how Micah is, knowing how our training, knowing how that training staff is and the coaching staff is, is they wouldn't let him come back and play if they didn't feel comfortable in him being able to come in and make certain tackles um, and being able to come in and be physical enough to play that position. So. I think if you see him come back, you'll see him be able to come back with no restrictions. Um, and he'll, in, in his mind, he'll come back the same way, like, I'm going to play the way I would normally play. So a couple more maybe before we let you go here, man. My new favorite player on defense is Terry Johnson. I absolutely love the way he plays. I love the dog in him. Um, I think slot corner is, 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 is a, you know, he, he might be the best one in the league. Was there a slot corner back in like the mid nineties? I know a lot of teams didn't run you know, three wide receiver sets quite a bit, but was, was that like a position then or at a newer position? And, and could you just talk about like how good Taron Johnson's at it? Hey, he's a third linebacker in, in a, yeah. in a DB's body. Yeah. When we had slot corner, um, when we got into that position, I was a slot corner. Um, so I, I understood how to play that position as well. Like he, he is definitely playing great. I think one of the things that we saw, um, going into it and one of the weaknesses of playing your slot corner is is you have an undersized guy effectively playing the outside linebacker lined up on 
sometimes yeah, that slot um, sometimes is a flexed out tight end. Uh, and so what you would normally do is, is to, to take advantage of that is, is if I see a slot corner, I'm running the ball. Like we're going to come in. You're going to just bring that big receiver to crack down on him or that tight end to crack down and block him and you try to run. Uh, and so you need somebody like Taryn who has just that fight in him that's going to go in and just kind of say, I'm going to get off this block. Um, they've got to be able to play the run and then be able to recognize the pass and get back. And he's really good at doing both. Um, as you mentioned, he's so physical. Um, he gets off blocks. He comes in in the run support. I mean, he's and he's bringing wood to be so so undersized as a corner. Like he's not one of the biggest corners, but he plays well. I love his game. Um, been fun watching him develop and grow um, into that position. And so it makes you be able to now match up wise, like because you already had linebackers um, and Tremaine and Matt that can match up on all the other people. But having Taryn means if, if they do go three wides or four wides, I can then kind of stay and be like, you know what, I can put you here and let the linebackers still flow and make plays. And so we would only do it sometimes. We didn't always stay in that position because back then you had a little bit bigger tight ends. They would run the ball and try to gash you um, in that formation. But the evolution of the game and, and teams running three wide and four wide um, necessitates that you have to have a nickel cornerback playing. So you need somebody like Taryn that can be adept in both the run support and the passing game. Would that um, be, be you effective. today? Would that be you today if you were playing? Would you be would you be the slot corner? I would have been the slot corner, yes. Um, I could play both. I could play outside and slot corner. Um, so and we would practice um being in both positions, but when we went not dime um or or nickel, I would be the guy coming in. Um and sometimes and it would be myself and then Marlo Perry sometimes would come in at dime if we wanted a linebacker to run with it. So so we we were able to match up and do things, and then sometimes if they went four wide, it would be myself and Ken Irvin. Uh, coming in uh, with Thomas Smith uh, and Jeff Burr. So we had a really deep secondary that can match up and cover. Um, and so this team reminds me of just how deep they are at corner with Benford and Dane and Trey. Um, and then, you know, you have so many other and, and Elam. Um, so you have corners that really can match up if you need to say we're going to play man to man, lock it down. Um, but and then you have great safeties in Micah and Jordan. Um, and so I was just like, you know, hey, this is going to be a really good team to watch uh, and, and linebackers in Milano and, and Edmond. So you love what they're doing uh, and what the team that they built um, and they, they're built for a long-term success. That's awesome. So as a slot corner that you played, you're more likely to be lined up against a tight end. Do you recall some of the harder tight ends play? Did you ever play it against Gonzalez or uh, Atlanta? You, don't, you only played him every few years the way that we didn't have to spend yeah, like we, we would play those guys, um, like Shannon Sharp and, and guys like that. We, we didn't mm. worry about it too much because we had Henry Jones. So yeah. we would try to oh, make yeah. sure we got the matchups that we wanted. Um, and we liked Henry Jones uh, on those tight ends sometimes. I think what, what hurt us is sometimes we would when they would do like a little bunch, like Denver would do some things where they would have the tight end tight, short receiver split, motion somebody across or somebody in. And then you're doing we, we would call a little slide where you're like, all right, we got to sort out who's taking who. Um, and so sometimes you'd have some mis miscommunication there. Um, but like the big tight ends are the guys that would give us problems because, you know, that's what they wanted. Like, Hey, you know what? You're going to motion over and I'm, I'm going to get put on Ben Coates. Um, who's, you know, six, five. Ben Coates, <laughs> he man. killed the bills. Just killed oh, the bills <laughs> off all day. He would push off all day. Like that's all he did. <laughs> turn around, push off and then turn and catch the hitch. And you're like, ref, that's offensive. Pass. Like, I didn't see anything. And you're like, oh, so, so team, you, you just kind of figure out how to play within the system um, and what it is. But Henry really always was a guy who got the, um, stuck on those tight ends. I always get get the slot guys like, leave me on the slot guy. <laughs> it's like, I'll keep receiving all day. <laughs> That's great. So in trying to communicate and in no way am I suggesting Bills fans do anything less than what they would normally do. And, you know, home field advantage is about making noise, making it hard for the, the quarterback of their team and the center and everything. But it sounds to me like – if you might admit that playing at home, uh, and if you are trying to, like you were just saying, <clears throat> make those adjustments verbally, uh, a little harder than on the road for them as an opposing team, yes, because I want the fans loud. You're going to see the defense doing like this, trying to get the crowd loud. Um, so then you go to a hand adjustment or a side adjustment, um, to kind of really try to take advantage of it. So if, if, if I'm Miami, you're, you already have a set of hand signals that you're like, hey, we're going to do this and do all these things on offense to kind of say this what is it should be loud. Um, I expect it to be loud uh, on Sunday and you want to make it difficult for them um, so they can burn timeouts or take too yeah. long or have a miscommunication and vice versa. On the flip side, you'll see the offense doing like this, like, you know, you'll see Josh and, and, and the guys on the sideline going, hey, 
quiet, let the offense work. I think really the game plan for Buffalo is to really try to come out and start fast. You want to start fast in this game. You want and you want to score touchdowns. Like you want to be like, hey, every time we go in, you don't want to trade field goals. You want to trade seven for three um, because the more you get up, that means the more they have to come out and do something that maybe they don't want to go into um, in this game plan. And so that's that's really the key to the game to me. Like, you know, we could talk about being able to have explosive plays or anything like that. No. Like when you get in the red zone, can you score seven points? Um, and if you can't, then you better limit them to three. Um, but you don't want to continue trading field goal for field goal or get down there and, and have empty trips because the closer the game is, the more confidence that they have that, hey, maybe we can get an upset. Um, and you don't want them gaining confidence. You want them feeling like, yep, all right, like, yeah, this is an uphill battle. We gave it our best shot, but we're going to lose this game. Um, and then you, you kind of say, all right, we know we can we can finish this game out. Do you um, do you have a person for us? <laughs> no, I don't make predictions. <laughs> for, <laughs> no predictions for me because I don't want to jinx. I'm like, nope. Like, yeah, I want to say enough. the word SB. Like, I'll I'll say the initials. I won't even say that. Like, people are like, we're, I'm like, nope, I'm not saying the word. Like, nothing. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing, I no prediction, not, no anything for uh, me. Just win. We won't make you make a prediction, but uh, it would be fun to have you back next week to talk yeah. about the next playoff game. Yeah, there you go. How about we? Uh, how about we tentatively? <laughs> okay, we know you're. Busy. How about we tentatively book you for next Friday, and we'll see where it goes. How about that? <laughs> Bet I, I will be more than happy to come on next Friday. Um, so yes, we can talk. But all right, thanks. Uh, I, I, thanks I, so I much. I want to get time. through Sunday first. Let's get through Sunday. <laughs> exactly. yeah, amen to that. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, we Bob. really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, right. man. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Uh, he's good. Yeah. Yeah, it just, uh, yeah, he knows what he's doing. He's yeah. slick. And he can explain, break things down really well, uh, yeah. you know, for, for the lame. And I, I meant that story in, in Detroit. I just was getting treated to people yelling about at the knees to turn around. And you, you know, you it's know, a hard too, job. You know, it, on t- TV, the NFL is like an excellent TV sport. The camera angles you have. Yeah. They show a play like that, and they show that. DB covering the receiver as if it's the only play going on. Right. There aren't 20, 20 other players right. somewhere else. And you see it on TV. Like, He's right there. Just turn around. Yeah. Like, oh, my no, God. You're right. as it's going. You're right. When, it is a different game when you watch it in person and a different game when you're up, you know, higher up. It, mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. It looks, it looks quote unquote easy on TV. It, it, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. So, you know what? Uh, we had Marilyn on here. And before we wrap it up, I, I sent this to you the other day. And I kind of wanted to something a little bit out of the box or as you know maybe some people who have been watching i am a huge boston red sox fan uh my my father was born in uh summers new hampshire which is a small town on the main new hampshire border do you know i never knew that until we started doing this podcast that i was a red sox fan no oh. of course i knew you're a red sox fan <laughs> how, how long uh, we went at it i have a time. tattoo on my leg uh, from the yankees family yeah, oh, I, my, know, my, I didn't know about your dad being from new england yep. until we had Sharon Jones, yep. Rusty Jones' wife, on, uh, who sang the national anthem. Rusty, of course, is the uh, uh, best strength and conditioning coach. And and you and her yep. shared about how they were from that. I didn't know. She Until she then. she grew up about ten minutes away from my dad. Yeah. So my dad's there. My grandfather and uh, my my grandmother passed away before I was born. But my grandfather remarried, and his wife was a huge Red Sox fan. He had season tickets for about twenty years during the dark of the Red Sox. So. That kind of connection with grandfather and um, the woman who I called grandma, who was, you know, my dad's stepmom. And they gave me baseball cards when I was five, six years old. And I was hooked. There's no baseball team here in Buffalo where I grew up. So the Red Sox became my team. And I was on, on an island here because it was Yankees, Mets, some Blue Jays, some mm-hmm. Indians. Not a lot of Red Sox fans in the 80s in Buffalo. There just weren't. And they weren't very good for a long time until... Obviously, 86 happened, and then, you know, they made the playoffs a couple more times. Fast forwarding and why this is relevant. 2004, um, Mm -hmm. after the 2003 tragedy in Yankee Stadium where Aaron Boone hit the home run off of Tim Wakefield, very, very, very similar to 13 seconds. Mm -hmm. It was get over the hump. You know, the same team beat you again. Mm -hmm. They're never going to win the championship. It had been 85 years at that point since they had won. Mm -hmm. So in 2004, I was all in as a fan. I watched probably 150 Red Sox games that year. And the whole town of Boston was all in that year. You know, for coming back from 03 and, and what are we going to add? Players, whatever, whatever. The whole season was just about going back. Turns out that they end up playing the Yankees again in the ALCS. They down 3 nothing, come back, win four straight, and go to the World Series. 
before the World Series started, um, there was this little message board. This is 2004 before Facebook, whatever. And it was Sons of Sam who was an old prospect. Well, yeah, what was it, though? It wasn't Facebook. What was no, it? No, it was, it was a message board, message like an AOL message board. Like AOL people, message board. Like people would, okay. yeah, this is 2004. Yeah. So people would, like, chat on there. It was like, me- like it just you'd write a message, and okay. then you'd wait five minutes, and somebody else would write a message. <laughs> right, and then, right, but it was, like, wonky baseball. Bill James. The, the guy, yeah. he was a part of it. It was real, like, wonky, analytical baseball talk. And I kind of, I found it one day, and, and I found it, you know, interesting and kind of comforting when they lost and whatever else. This guy started this thread on there called Win It For. And he basically wrote an opener to the Red Sox saying, I want you to win the World Series for these reasons mm-hmm. for these people in my life I see where you're going with it and it turned into <laughs> this before yeah. the internet went viral it turned into a viral sensation they had fifty thousand people writing letters and saying what what was important why they wanted the team to win yeah. you know pay, paying tribute to people who had passed away sure. you know people who would never be able to see the red sox in the world just because it had been 86 years at that point so i figured that i would just do my own here sure. for the bills go. i was gonna wait and you know if they um make that big game later on in the year that Marlon wouldn't mention, but I'm going to do it at the start of the playoff run. And then maybe if anybody else on here, you know, who's watching or sits on YouTube or follows us on Twitter, ever wants to, you know, do their own, or if Don next week, you, you know, want to put one together. Um, so I'm just, I, I wrote a little bit, in, a few notes. And I kind of wanted to just address it to Dion Dawkins, who had that amazing letter yesterday yeah. to the city of Buffalo. Oh, that was cool. And then that hype video that the bills did last night, which, Cool. Made made my wife not fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, it so yeah. it, this is like kind of addressed to the team and to anybody in the organization that has like a direct impact on the the the, the game, the mm-hmm. outcome. Yeah. So you know, I would I would just ask you know for me and, and for the community that the Bills win it first and foremost for for three, four, seventy eight, twelve, and eighty three. Mm-hmm. When I was thinking about putting this together, those four are like the Mount Rushmore of my childhood. Sure. Yeah. Nothing would move me more. Nothing would make me happy as a fan as in, in September coming out of the tunnel would be those four in uniform with either the trophy or some semblance of AFC championships from the 90s or whatever. The next group of people I would love the Bills to win the Super Bowl for would be guys like Steve Tasker, Chris Hale, John Davis, Pete Metzlers, and all of the lesser known guys on the 90s team that went through either one Super Bowl loss Two, three, all four of the Super Bowls. We've had we've had guys on our program, man. They still care so much. The names you just mentioned have been on with us earlier. All year. those guys, yeah, carry around Buffalo as a badge of honor, and I think it would mean the world to them. They're ambassadors to win. still, yeah. I want the Bills win the Super Bowl for Coach Levy, who's ninety-seven years old, and absolutely deserves to win the Super Bowl. Coach Levy met me when I was a wide-eyed 22-year-old intern in the merchandise department and couldn't have been any nicer. Yeah. He could have big-timed me. He could have you know, told me to buzz off, kid, and he gave me five minutes of his time, a smile, and every single time I saw him in the building after that, he remembered my name. Mm-hmm. I want them to win for the John Butler and the, the late Ralph Wilson as well. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for Scott Norwood, for Ronnie Harmon, for Thurman Thomas's missing helmet in Super Bowl 26, like Von Miller said at the beginning of the season, burn it all. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for the late Van Miller, who I had the pleasure of sitting next to on the plane rides. And boy, a plane ride with Van to Seattle was an experience before iPods and headphones, but nobody loved the Bills more. And if they ever do win the Super Bowl, I will be a little bit sad and bittersweet that he was not able to call it. And obviously, for, you know, for John Murphy as well, who recovering. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for guys like Woody, who was on our podcast, Henry, who was on our podcast, even for guys like Lieutenant Boiler, guys who worked at the Bills who you never know, never heard of, who, you know, in the 90s when I was there, 2000s, weren't paid all that well. It's not, it wasn't, you know, you weren't overly paid at the Bills if you were support staff. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for Del Reed, for LaShawn German, and all of the guys on social media who give more than they get from the team, from got the guys who start all of these you know social movements of giving and the Bills Mafia and the incredible things that they do. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for the victims of the top shooting, the people who lost their lives in the blizzard, in that New Year's Eve fire, and anybody who could use a pick-me-up after a year around here that obviously everybody knows is really hard. That video did a nice job of incorporating those elements. Yeah. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for my friends Josh Knight, 
and Mark Leeson and my dad's friend, uh, Hank Finkowski, guys who go to the stadium every single week have app tailgate setups. They've been doing it since the bills have sucked. They do it in good weather, in bad weather. Josh and, and Mark have a bus that they park right behind Prohibition, and they are there rain or shine, night or day, 7 a.m., 11 a.m., night game, whatever. The dedication to the team and going through the entire drought, to me, was incredible. Uh, Hank Finkowski has been a season ticket holder for probably 45 years, and I'm sure he represents thousands of guys and, and girls who have been doing it forever. He rocks a Kavika middle jersey sometimes to the <laughs> stadium. Uh it would mean that he's 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 advancing in age, and it mean the world to him and and his family for the Bills to win Super Bowl. I want, I want to mention I, I worth Mitchell. He was a great guy. Whatever reason you have his jersey, he, he is, is. I want the Bills to win Super Bowl for my friends Pat Walsh and Eric Vinkowski, who are take my wife to the games and in the club seat every uh, <laughs> every week. And I know how much it would mean to guys like them and, and everybody who's a fan and in my age range and everybody who has been through the Super Bowl years, you know, either as a kid or a teenager and has given up. I want the Bills to win Super Bowl for Eric Fisher, Greg Tomset, Aaron Quinn, and all the great guys that we've met at Club One, all of the other social media bloggers and 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 bites that have popped up give you know time and effort dedication to something that doesn't pay all that well at, at all but they love the team they love the city and they love the community uh, a couple more here i want the bills to win the super bowl for my mother-in-law sally zajac hmm. and for all of the people who've lost somebody that they used to watch the games with. Yeah. um my my mother-in-law is the one she's a widower she used to watch the games with my father-in-law bob she still scuzzes the TV every time Patrick Mahomes comes on. Scuzzing meaning wishing ill will or bad luck. She hates the coach of the Miami Dolphins. And she watches and, and I know would want her husband to see the Bills win the Super Bowl. I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for my boys, Jackson and Tice, who are 10. I kind of want them to experience what I have not been able to experience. And, and when I say that when the Red Sox won in 2004 – it altered my life. It really kind of did. Hmm. It made me believe in things more. It made me not always think that the worst thing was going to happen. Hmm. And I was able to have, a, it's weird to say about a football team, but I was able to have a confidence going forward that, you know what? The worst thing might not always happen. You might be able to overcome all of these adversities. So I want them to for my boys. I three more. I want them. I want, roll. This good I want them to win for my wife. Obviously, this year, uh, Bill's Mafia Babes became, you know, a bigger deal. And there was a whole controversy about women in football. Nobody loves the Bills more than my wife. And she tolerated meeting me at a time where I wasn't in the same position as I am now. And I really didn't care for the Bills. So she has maintained her love and her dedication throughout you know, the 90s and, and throughout the drought. She is one of those people who refuses to turn a game off even if they're up by 25 points and there's a more compelling game going on. Christine Lee told us, I want, I want those to win the Super Bowl for her and for all, all the women in Western New York who don't get the respect and, and that they deserve as, as football fans. I want the bills to win the Super Bowl for my friend over here, Gordon Lewis, Purdy, the third. I, think so. very few people know what a good person he is. Uh, how much he meant to the Bills organization. He's humble to a fault. Um, he's not always his own best advocate, which frustrates me at times. <laughs> I know the journey that he was on with the team from a young kid in the ticket office in the 80s to going through the four Super Bowls and not winning. Uh, he gave me, he picked up the phone when I called him for an internship. Uh, he gave me nothing but respect and opportunity. He advocated for me when it came time to be promoted. Cried with me when I got fired. Uh, he also you know, went through the entire doubt and did everything that he did with integrity and with honesty. And it's a, it's a tribute to him, all the people who have been able to come on this show and willing to come on this show and talk about the Bills. When he got let go, things were a little dicey for him. And, and it's taken a couple years, rightfully so, to get to a place where, where he is now. And, and I'd like to think that this podcast has, has helped that bit. And I want the Bills to win because I feel like it would be a culmination and and kind of a an achievement for him, even though he's not there anymore. I feel that. I appreciate that. I really do. Last but not least, and selfishly, 
I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl for me. There you go. Um, and that I, that <laughs> statement, I don't think I would. I I know I wouldn't have said 10, 15, 20 years ago. I was a kid just growing up right near Maine and Billy. I loved football to the point where I would take Connect Four pieces and I would play a football game. I'm an only child. I would play a football game on the rug that I can't even describe to people how I played with the dice and Connect Four pieces and two playbooks. So I was both teams. I was the offense and the defense. I would draw and design plays as a kid. I ended up interning and, and, and spending two years working for free at the Bills with just the hope of getting a $19,000 a year job in the merchandise or marketing department. I turned that with some luck, some hard work, and some great advocates into the absolute job of a lifetime that I would have never even conceived of getting that changed life. And unfortunately, that ended way too quickly, and it took me a decade, a decade to recover from it. I still lived in Buffalo. I didn't want to live in Buffalo anymore afterwards. I've told you on here how it felt like, and I know you love this, it felt like Somebody was wearing the picture of your ex-wife or your ex-girlfriend on their hat, on their jacket, on their bumper sticker, on their car, <laughs> everywhere I went. I couldn't get away from the Bills. They just love her. At first, I hated the Bills. I was I was upset. I was hurt. I couldn't I couldn't feel them winning. I couldn't stand or tolerate the idea of them winning the Super Bowl and me not being there or not being a fan because it meant so much to me. The four the four Super Bowl years were my high school years. Like I loved this team. I loved this town, loved this community. Thankfully, around 2017, 2018, you know, Coach McDermott and 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 Brandon Bean come in, just the way that they ran the organization, the fact that they got better, the fact that they're entertaining, the fact that my boys were getting older and I didn't want to be somebody who denied them the communal experience of Buffalo. My wife wore me down watching her on New Year's Eve of 2017 cry in the living room when Tyler Boyd scored and crossed the end zone. I had no choice. I finally was able to let go a lot of, of a lot of the bitterness and a lot of the anger that only I was carrying. The Bills had clearly moved on from me 15 years earlier. I need to move on to. So I was able to, over the course of these last few years, really start to embrace team and to enjoy what it does for the fans and the community and, frankly, what it does for me. So for the first time in 20 years, which is a big deal, I want the Bills to win the Super Bowl. So win it for all of us, Buffalo. Go Bills. Nothing more to add. It's great.